All right, folks, back with Chapter 8, Psychology of Athletic Performance. Oops, sorry, Athletic Preparation and Performance. So what we're going to do is um, talk about the overall goals, and then there's a few, maybe like five big topics um, that we're going to touch on. Um, and like I said in the last lecture, I'm going to try to relate this to regular life too, because I think that you know, like the sports psychology, the principles within that can really apply to everything that you do in life. Uh, so goal setting being a major one, okay? So the three major goals with sports psychology is to really see if there are relationships that exist between these different variables that we're gonna talk about, such as motivation, that's one and um, performance, okay? And then see if there are any models or research that exists um, on these phenomena that we could apply and then allow them to improve athletic performance or I would say performance in life in general. <clears throat> so I think that first of all, we wanna kind of think about like what is the ideal performance state, right? What kind of mindset do we need to be in before we compete or even before we just go to the gym uh, and and lift, right? Because if you're not really into it, you're not excited about it, you're not gonna get as much out of it, okay? So they have a checklist here. Um, number one, oh my gosh, could we think of anything more important in life right now than the absence of fear, right? Fear is crippling. And in fact, it's crippling civilization in general right now. And that's why I always encourage you all to be brave. Do not give in to the fear, okay? In an athletic sense, if we have fear, fear of failure, then we're often going to uh, not perform as well, right? So we need to really go into an activity and um, be excited about it and be brave and just know that if we fail, it's okay. People fail all the time and guess what? They get back up and they, and they go again, okay? Um, another thing that we wanna avoid is Overthinking things, okay? Um, another a phrase I like to use is like this uh, paralysis by analysis, right? You think about things so much that you kind of freeze up and you don't take any action. How do we get rid of that in athletics? Well, practice, right? You want to get to the point where these things you're doing are second nature to you so you don't have to think about them because if you think about something too much, you're not going to do as well, right? Like if any of you play golf, if you sit there and think about your golf swing too much, you're going to hit it in the woods, right? But if it's nice and smooth, you just get up there and hit the ball, usually it's gonna go much better. Shooting a free throw at the end of a game, same idea. If you're thinking about the mechanics too much, you're gonna end up shooting an air ball or bricking it off the backboard. Um, figuring out how much, how narrow or broad your attention focus should be, that's gonna vary, I think, based upon the activity that we're in. We're gonna touch on that a little bit later. By practicing, you should have this sense of effortless where everything that you're doing is going to come natural, okay? Also, by doing that, you are in more control of the situation, right? And, and you also are able to know there's things you can't control and you choose to not focus on those things. That's equally as important. Know what you can control, control those things. Do not worry about the things that are outside of your control, okay? Again, that lesson applies to life um, very much as well, okay? Uh, this last bullet point, distortion of, of time and space. Um, it is kind of weird when you're competing. Time tends to go very fast and very slow, depending upon the situation of the game. But I think just realizing that there's, again, nothing you can do about that and focusing on the things that you can control. Time is really not something you can control, so there's really no point in focusing too much on that outside of certain uh, situations. Okay. So the first big topic is kind of distinguishing here between um, two A words, arousal uh, and anxiety. Now, a lot of people think that there is an optimal level of arousal that we want to achieve that can help us uh, to succeed, right? We need to have some arousal, otherwise we're gonna be sluggish, lazy, less reactive, but on the, if we're too aroused, then often we're gonna have a lack of focus because we're gonna be all over the place, right? So there is, we're gonna see in a second, there's kind of like this um, inverted U 
where there's an optimal level in the middle of that U where your performance is actually enhanced, okay? By being hyper aroused, we could transition into a state of anxiety where we are um, so on edge that we have this anxiety over the situation, right? The last thing you want to have in athletics is anxiety about the situation, either before it or while you're in it. In most cases, those are going to be counterproductive to you, okay? They divide anxiety into two categories, cognitive anxiety and somatic. Cognitive anxiety, think of that as like a learned anxiety. Um, so by being in a stressful situation repeatedly and, and being anxious in that situation, your body learns that when that situation is upcoming, the anxiety is going to kick in, right? If you've had bad experiences in a sport, then often you may have cognitive anxiety about that sport. When I was a kid, I played baseball. I tried to. I was horrible at it. Had a lot of bad experiences. Um, so it got to the point in the season where as a game was approaching, I would start having this cognitive anxiety that my body had learned due to the negative experience in that situation to have a stress response to it. Okay. Um, now, somatic anxiety is more the anxiety you feel in the moment in response to the different stimuli in the situation. That can be a good thing at times because often anxiety, a small bit of it, can elevate your arousal and make you perform better. But the key is you don't want it to transition into that a level where it paralyzes you and, and gives you fear. Okay, uh, And then experiencing high levels of somatic anxiety over and over again can then transition into cognitive anxiety. So back to my example, missing a fly ball once in the outfield produces somatic anxiety, but missing a fly ball over and over and over again led to the cognitive anxiety because it became a learned response. Okay. Both of those obviously involve stress. You know, stress is going to promote anxiety. Um, as we've talked about in class before, Exercise is a stress. Um, there are emotional and mental stressors as well. A small amount of stress can be positive, and our body is going to respond in a positive way to it and prepare us to overcome that stress. Okay, and The key is, though, we need to not let that stress overwhelm us, and we need to not let that stress become chronic where it's always there because that's going to then lead to back to what we saw here, which is the anxiety, right? So... That level of stress, which is positive, they call eustress, which is sort of like the optimal level. Um, if it becomes too much and it becomes negative, they call that distress. Okay. In life, we're going to experience stress. The key is learning how to handle it and to channel that energy in a positive way. Okay. Luckily, physical activity actually helps us do that quite a bit. So the stress that we feel as a result of participation in athletics is really not a horrible thing from a physiological perspective versus the stress we feel like emotional or mental stress. Sitting on your butt and feeling stress is actually pretty damaging physiologically, especially when it becomes chronic experienced over and over again. Okay, so there's a few theories that have been proposed to sort of explain this phenomenon of arousal and anxiety. And the first one is uh, the drive theory that states as arousal or anxiety increases, so too does performance. Now, is that true to an extent? Yes. However, as I documented to you, at a certain point, the anxiety is going to increase so much that the performance might start to decline, right? So that's why this theory is typically not seen as one that is completely accurate. On the other hand, this one is much more well accepted, and this is the inverted, inverted U theory. So what this theory is showing us, I think, is the best expressed in this first graph here, right? So we have um, performance here, arousal across the bottom. That if the arousal is too low, the performance is low. If the arousal is also too high, the performance is also low. We achieve optimal performance when we have this sort of optimal arousal, right? So this is where we want to be. We want to have maybe a little bit of anxiety that gets us excited and gets our blood flowing, body temperature elevated. 
stimulates metabolism, increases ATP availability, etc. But not so much stress, anxiety that we become overcome by it and fail to perform. Sorry about that. I did not mean to advance that slide. There we go. Uh, and basically, um, these graphs are kind of variations. So this is kind of looking at the personality type, um, looking at an introvert versus an extrovert. An extrovert might need a little bit more arousal than an introvert does to reach that level of peak performance, right? And I think you probably know people in your life that fit both of those descriptions and can maybe think about that, right? Like I'm personally more of an introvert. So even when I'm very excited, I'm not going to be aroused to the level of an extrovert, maybe somebody I know in my life who's always real animated, who gets like super pumped up when they have this high level of arousal. So there's going to be a difference, I guess, based upon uh, your personality type. Okay. This is also here interesting because it's looking at the complexity of the skill, right? Um, if you need to perform fine motor skills, Performance is typically done best at a lower level of arousal versus a simple sports skill. So an example of that could be like an Olympic weightlift versus a deadlift, right? For the deadlift, you just want to get super fired up and knock it out. Versus with the Olympic lift, there's a little bit more technique and skill to it. So maybe a slightly lower level of arousal might be the optimal thing there. Uh, then the reversal theory sort of, again, there's some truth to this one as well. And this one is sort of the opposite of the drive theory, which states that as perform as arousal increases, the performance is going to come down, right? So really, you could say the drive theory and the reversal theory are integrated together in the inverted U theory, which is personally why I think this one um, has the most legitimacy to it. Okay, so now let's transition to our next topic, which is motivation. Basically, we have two forms of motivation, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic motivation is something that kind of comes from within, right? People who are intrinsically motivated, they are not motivated by external reward. They're motivated by the feelings that they get from success, right? On the other hand, an extrinsically motivated person is motivated by some external reward, such as trophy, a medal, money, fame, whatever it is, right? Um, I think it's okay to have both of those things, right? There is, I would say personally, I have a high level of intrinsic motivation, but it's also, I have some extrinsic motivation as well. The only true negative, I think, is if you're purely extrinsically motivated uh, because you're not going to win every time. And if you're purely extrinsically motivated, you're going to set yourself up for failure versus if you're intrinsically motivated, even if you don't win, you can still get some satisfaction out of you know, working hard, giving your best effort, etc. So ultimately, I think success is going to come from really a blend of these two with a little bit more in favor of the intrinsic uh, motivation, okay? You know, if you think about practice versus games, if you are more, feel more motivation to participate in games, you might be more extrinsically motivated, where if you really enjoy both practice and the games, like if you really love practice, then that can be more of an intrinsically motivated person. So I think when you're working with an athlete, um, you want to try to figure out where their motivation lies. Uh, and when you're trying to motivate them, either in the weight room or on the field, you might need to use their motivator to get them going, right? If you have an extrinsically motivated athlete, you might need to dangle some carrots in front of that person to get them to, uh, to get going with like maybe, I don't know, this is a stupid example, but like a gift card or something like that. I don't know where an intrinsically motivated person, they may not require as much coaching to get them going. The externally motivated person might require that coaching in your face. Maybe that's a better example, uh, actually. 
<clears throat> achievement motivation, I think, you know, there's crossover, I think. Both of these people could be motivated um, by achievements, okay? But again, is it the achievement of, is the achievement intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated? I know that's a stupid way to say it, but do I feel good because I succeeded inside myself or do I feel good because I succeeded to please other people, right? That is, I guess, a way that we might look at this one. Um, another way to look at motivation, are, are people motivated to achieve success or are they motivated to avoid failure? Obviously, there's much more positive connotation with this one, much more of a negative connotation with this one. In general, in life, I think we should avoid negative outlooks. So I would not recommend that you adopt this. And if you identify in an athlete that you might be working with one day, that they are motivated to avoid failure, you want to try to flip that, right? How do you do that? Well, having success will breed success, okay? So if somebody has a pattern of failure, you need to set them up with small victories, that they can achieve one after the other, establish a pattern of success, and then they will like that. They'll like success more than failure, so they will become more motivated to go after that feeling of success rather than being motivated just to avoid failure, right? So we're flipping that negative situation to a positive situation. Speaking of positive, uh, we have the different types of reinforcement and punishment. <clears throat> It's hard to say one or the other is better, right? Um, positive is probably better, but there is still time <clears throat> for negative reinforcement, definitely. Part of that comes with identifying what motivates your athlete. Or what their level of motivation is in general, right? If somebody is not very motivated, negative reinforcement is just going to continue to pull their motivation down. But if they're already highly motivated, they can probably handle a little bit of negative reinforcement, okay? <clears throat> you also need to read the situation, right? If your team that you're coaching or you're working with a group of athletes in the strength and conditioning field and they are, they've lost a bunch of games in a row, negative reinforcement is only gonna make them feel worse about themselves. So they would probably need more positive reinforcement in that situation. On the other hand, you might have a group that has been very successful and their heads are starting to swell and they're becoming very arrogant. They could benefit from some negative reinforcement to bring them back down to earth, right? So again, this requires you to really read the situation, um, the individual athletes, uh, the team psyche as a whole, and develop a good mixture of these things, okay? Because I think that there is there is a place for some degree of negative reinforcement and punishment. It just depends upon uh, the situation, the psyche of the athlete, and the psyche of the team uh, in general. Okay. Uh, next big topic is attention and focus. So, based upon the sport, we may be required to have a very broad focus or a very narrow focus and even within a given sport that focus can change and widen or shrink depending upon uh, the different situation so a couple key terms attention in general is processing information that comes into your awareness selective attention is essentially blocking out certain stimuli and focusing on certain things right a real clear example of that is like if you're if you're an athlete on the field in front in at a stadium and there's anywhere from five to 50,000 people around you cheering and getting mad and emotional, you need to block those people out, right? Keep your attention on what's happening on the field. Do not worry about what is going on uh, in the stands, okay? So a, re a recommended way to be able to develop that selective attention is to use a routine, right? So you have this ritual that you do um, going through a mental checklist, uh, and a lot of you probably do that even before you leave the house in the morning, right? We all develop these routines that we get into that help us focus on accomplishing the task at hand. We can apply that to athletics, uh, strength and conditioning as well, right? Maybe even just going to the gym to train 
you probably have a sequence of things that you do before you go there. You make sure that you have your water, you have your um, your AirPods or your earphones. You make sure your phone is charged. Maybe you make sure you have some music or a playlist downloaded. You have um, a podcast, whatever it is. We all have this mental checklist that helps us kind of get our attention focused on that task that we want to do. So that checklist helps us prepare and get our attention uh, where it needs to be. So they tend to sort of split attention into this these four quadrants. So at the top is broad and narrow, and then over here we have external and internal. So let's let me just throw out a situation. Let's say that you're a quarterback um, about to snap the ball. Clearly, you need to have uh, an external focus on what is happening, right? So we're going to be on the left side. And at this point, our attention is going to be pretty broad because we're surveying the field, right? Now, as the ball is snapped, we still have an external focus. But now we're trying to find a receiver who's open. Once we find that person that we want to throw to, quickly we're going to shift to a much more um, narrow focus, right? So we're going to kind of change it, maybe depending upon the situation. Now, on the other hand, let's think of a, more of a solo sport, such as, uh, well, I think weight training could fall there, right? When you're, when you're lifting, you really don't need to pay much attention to anything externally. It's much more internally focused, um, especially if you're training by yourself. Um, even something like playing golf or shooting a free throw in basketball, there's more of a, an internal mental game that you're playing before doing those activities. So you're going to have much more of an internal and a more narrow focus. Like if you're shooting a free throw to win the basketball game with two seconds left, you need to block out everything else, have your focus be very narrow on that basket, and you're going to be sort of going through this internal, going back here to the routine, right, that we go through before shooting that free throw so we can succeed in that event, right? So, but then say you hit the free throw, there's two seconds left, all of a sudden you've got to get back on defense. Now your attention is going to shift back to be very broad and external, right? So even within a single sport, um, your focus and attention is going to shift. It's going to widen, it's going to shrink, it's going to go outward, it's going to go inward, and you're going to have to have the kind of the flexibility to allow it to change um, as the situation dictates it. A lot of you probably have developed these without even being aware of it, but I'm sure that you that you probably have. Okay. Um, now, part of this, well, let's go back to our example of shooting the free throw, right, down here. You're going to be very anxious in that situation. So part of succeeding in that situation is uh, relaxing a little bit, right? So here are some suggested techniques for uh, relaxation to help bring down a level of arousal or anxiety that might manifest itself in a certain situation, which I would say shooting a free throw to win a game would definitely qualify as, right? So breathing, focusing on that, you know. Um, I would challenge all of you all to do that. When you're feeling anxious, if you notice that your, your heart is beating fast, um, just become more conscious of your breathing. Try to slow your breathing down, take deep breaths, and you really will feel yourself relax. Like we all have the power through our breathing to slow down our heart rate, which is sort of symbolic of relaxing. So we all have the ability to do that, but again, it's practicing it and then being able to do it in those stressful situations like shooting a free throw at the end of the game. That's gonna come with practice, right? So putting yourself in that situation is gonna give you a greater ability to relax in that situation. Oops. Uh, next topic is imagery, right? So what are you imagining in your head when you're experiencing a given activity? Hopefully you thought to yourself, um, you're experiencing success, right? We really do have the power in our brains to kind of manifest things into reality, right? So if you're negative and you always see yourself failing, guess what's going to happen? You're going to fail, right? But if you always see yourself succeeding, I'm not saying you're going to succeed every time, but you're going to be much more likely to succeed, right? So part of uh, something that athletes can be taught to do on their own and outside of competition is to 
go through in their head picturing the situation that they're going to be in and seeing themselves have success, right? That's the next best thing to actually doing it is, is really thinking about it. And because that could, your brain is, has a powerful organ, obviously, and even having those thoughts in your head and, and practicing them can translate into some success, right? So positive imagery is a really important thing to, uh, to teach an athlete uh, about as you're preparing them to be successful, either in the gym or um, on the field as well. In the gym, if I'm about to deadlift 300 pounds and I'm visualizing myself hurting my back when I'm doing it, then that's probably going to happen. But if I just visualize myself just yanking that weight off the floor, I'm going to be much more likely to be able to do that. Self-confidence can kind of translate into that, right? So that's another thing. Um, confidence is one of those tricky things that is best developed through experience, right? So you're going to have more confidence in your ability to hit that free throw to win the game if you've been in that situation before. Now, that's not a common situation, but you can simulate that through practice, right? So successful coaches will simulate stressful situations in practice um, so athletes can succeed in those situations in practice. That will build some confidence so that when they're actually in the situation, they're going to believe that they can do it because they've already done it before, right? I typically sometimes will still get nervous before giving a lecture in person, but then I just think back to myself, like, you've done this a thousand times, right? So I know I've done it before and I've succeeded, so there's no reason why I can't do it right now, right? That's kind of the best way to get confidence is through uh, the experience, right? So that's why I think you all, even though you might be scared, you need to force yourself to experience things in your college career because you're going to be more confident in yourself going into your professional career if you've gotten the experience on some level uh, in your college career, okay? And that experience and confidence really develops this sense of self-efficacy where you have the true belief and knowledge that you can do something, right? You don't need to rely on other people to help you or to do it for you. You know that you can do it yourself. That's really what self-efficacy really means, um, is you're not relying on other people. You have the confidence in your ability to do it and to do it right and to do it well, okay? Again, that is something that comes through experience, and that's why it's really important for you all to volunteer and, and get experience doing things in the field that you want to move into um, once you gra graduate from college. I'm not a huge proponent of self-talk, um, but the reality is, is that we all have an internal dialogue going on in our heads all the time, right? So I want you all to pay attention to your, your dialogue. Um, if it's a mostly negative dialogue, then you probably are struggling to get things done and succeed. Um, versus if you're having a mostly positive dialogue inside your head, then you're more likely to be successful, right? So if you identify um, that you or somebody you're working with has a lot of negative self-talk going, you got to work to flip that. Okay. How do we do that? Well, first of all, try to figure out like, what do you, why are you so negative? What experience has led to you developing this negativity? Okay. That's a big step is admitting it. And then figuring out concrete ways to reverse that. And we're going to talk about that here in a second with goal setting. But I think that, yeah, through goal setting, we can help to start develop more of this positive mindset. And I kind of mentioned how we do that earlier as well. Setting people up with a pattern of success, even if they're small victories that can get them feeling much more positive about themselves and they will then start developing more of a positive internal dialogue and once they get on that path they're going to be set up for uh, success will they still fail sometimes yes but they'll be a lot better equipped to handle failure and they're going to be more likely to be more successful as well all right, so let's get to the last topic. The big one is goal setting. So I'm a huge fan of this. This is kind of one of my favorite topics. I'll try not to talk more than 10 minutes on it. It's very hard to succeed in life without goals, okay? And when you think of the goal, you might think of a goal like, I want to lose 20 pounds, or I want to gain 20 pounds. I want to make $1,000, whatever that goal might be. 
Those things that I just identified though, those are outcomes, right? An outcome goal is something that you hope to achieve. Okay, like the example given on the slide is the outcome is I want to win the game, All right? Well, you really can't control winning the game because there's other players playing too and they the other team wants to win the game too, right? Um, I really can't control getting a thousand dollars, like just saying I want a thousand dollars. Nobody's just going to come give me a thousand dollars. What do I have to do to get a thousand dollars? I have to work for it, right? To win the game, you have to work to win the game and do the things required to win the game, right? So those things required to get the money or to win the game are what are known as process goals, or I like to call them behavior goals. Okay, Behavior goals or process goals, and I'm just going to say behavior goals for the rest of this because that's the term I like better. Those are things you can control, right? Nobody's going to give me $1,000, but if I go to work every single day and I check that box, I'm going to get $1,000. I'm not just going to magically lose 20 pounds, but if I go to the gym every day, uh, if I eat a certain number of calories every day, and I get eight hours of sleep every night, I'm going to be very likely to achieve my outcome of losing 20 pounds. Okay, So basically, we could kind of reframe it like this. The outcome is what you hope to achieve. The behavior goals are the steps you have to take to reach the desired outcome. Okay, so when uh, somebody is setting goals, what I like to do with them is figure out what are you trying to achieve? You want to increase your squat by 50 pounds, whatever it is, we're going to write that down. Okay, um, we're going to make sure we make that goal. We're going to structure it in a certain way. We're not just going to say I want to get stronger because how do you know if you got stronger? You don't really know. So you have to quantify the goal, which is going to let's, let's jump ahead to the next slide really quick. You have to make a goal smart, okay? So it's gonna be specific. So rather than saying, I wanna get stronger, I'm gonna say, I wanna add 25 pounds to my max bench press. It's specific, okay? It's measurable because I know maybe before I could do 185, now I wanna add 25, so I wanna to get to 210, right? It's a measurable goal. I'll know if I got there or not, because if I can't lift 210, then I failed. But if I can, then I did. It needs to be achievable, which means it can't be such an outlandish goal that you're setting yourself up for failure. Like if I said I wanted to add 200 pounds to my bench press, that's not going to happen. But 25, that's achievable, okay? And it's also realistic. These two kind of go hand in hand. Um, and then lastly, the goal should be timely, which means we should put a timeline on it, right? If I just say I want to add 25 pounds to my bench press, well, by when? By the time you're 50, by the time you're 60, by the time you're by March, which is two weeks away, right? We have to put a timeline on it so we know how long we have to achieve that goal. So I would say I want to add 25 pounds to my bench press by, uh, let's say, April the 1st, right? March the 1st is not realistic because it's already February the 12th, but maybe by April 1st, that is much more realistic. That's achievable. I put a timeline on it. It's measurable because I said 25 pounds and it's very specific, right? So when you're setting your outcome goal, you want to make sure that you satisfy these criteria and the acronym SMART is, de is derived from these words here, okay? So we might also say the outcome goal is more of a long-term long goal or the process goals are much more short-term in nature. Okay? Not always, but usually that's kind of the way it works. Um, so to stick with that idea of adding 25 pounds to my bench press, that's my outcome. I would need to set myself a series of behavior goals, um, things I can do every day or a few times a week for that six-week time period. Right, And if I do those things, I can be reasonably sure I'm going to reach my outcome. So if I brainstorm a few behavior goals, if I want to get stronger in the bench press, I need to do the bench press. So one of my behavior goals might be to train with the bench press three times a week. Okay, Literally, I could look at a calendar. I could check off the boxes every day that I do that, and I will know if I achieve that goal. If I only have a week where I have two check marks, I did not achieve that goal that week. Okay. Uh, another good process goal for that outcome might be um, consuming 
150 grams of protein every day, right? We need protein intake to support muscle growth. If I wanna gain strength, I need to gain muscle, so I need to consume enough protein. Lastly, we know that growth occurs when we're recovered, so I would wanna make sure that I'm getting adequate sleep. Um, it's really hard to say I'm gonna get eight hours of sleep every night. I, I would personally prefer to say I wanna to go to bed by this time. I can't control if I get eight hours of sleep, but I can control what time I go to bed. So my goal, my third goal might be I wanna get in bed by 11 o'clock every night. Right. Again, that's something I could do every single day. Check a box. If I do it every day for six weeks, I would achieve my outcome. Okay. Uh, let's just review these bullet points. Yeah, these are typically, obviously, the long term and the short term goals are related. Right. Um, the long term goal should be significant and give you a sense of accomplishment when you achieve it. It shouldn't be. If I said I wanted to add five pounds to my bench press, that's not really that much. 25 pounds is significant, and I would feel good about that. Um, anything else here? I don't think so. So, for this a study assignment, um, there's only one for both chapters, right? The, the study questions are going to come from both chapters 7 and 8. The critical thinking assignment is chapter eight only, and it's it's a question about goal setting. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to come up with an outcome goal, whatever it is. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, just make sure that you fulfill these smart goal qualifications, and then you're going to take your outcome and choose. I think I asked you to do three behavior goals that will fit your outcome. Now your behavior goals also should fall into this category as well. Okay, So going to bed at 11 o'clock every night is specific, it's measurable, it's achievable, it's realistic, and it's timely. There's a time frame on it. Okay, So that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Um, I, I went fast, but I still took 37 minutes. Um, if you have any questions about this psychology thing, I'm more than happy to answer them. And uh, I will talk to you all next week. Take care.